Uh, there's been quite an um, active Q&A uh, section in our Zoom seminar this time. And um, I've also mentioned in our chat uh, section that I will try best to address uh, all of the questions, or at least most of the questions, though uh, I could also sense that in uh, parts of the questions which is being, um, uh, being uh, addressed, uh, most of the uh, topics of the questions in one way or another has already been touched or been covered slightly at least by uh, Prof Shah during his presentation, but perhaps some extra elaboration would be um, uh, important and would be interesting for us to get uh, your input, Prof Shah. Yeah? I will start with the question by uh, Y.L. Lau. So his question is regarding the uh, NSC, yeah? the National Security Council, uh, I believe. Um, so, in fact, he started his question with an interesting uh, way as well. Um, I, I, it, I, it is clearly sure, uh, for me, perhaps also the same with uh, others as well, that almost every day we'll be receiving text uh, messages uh, on phone by the Majlis Keselamatan Negara uh, sharing um, updates or sharing messages, important advices uh, regarding uh, the situation of COVID and how does it affect the, uh, the larger segments of Malaysians. Um, so the questions by why allow specifically address the rules and the um, authorities and perhaps the limits of the NSC uh, when it comes to uh, regulating uh, or governing the situation uh, in Malaysia. So uh, YLL allow ask whether does this mean that the NSC, National Security Council now, is controlling and coordinating government entities on um, all the operations in the country? Does it mean that uh, it is the um, NSC the issuing directives to government entities or matters relating to national security in a broader sense? Um, or does it also mean that NSC is effectively taken over cabinet so there are, and, and also how, how does the relations between the NSC and the parliament itself when it comes to the current uh, regulation. So there are, uh, YL Lau has listed several points of questions related to the NSC. Perhaps uh, Prof Shad can give uh, some additional elaboration on that. Yes. Actually, that's an excellent question. The only um, um, challenge uh, is this that time won't permit a uh, review of all the provisions of the National Security Council Act. Uh, let me first point out the National Security Council Act is an ordinary law. By ordinary, I mean it is not an emergency law. It's not a law passed under Article 150. It's not a law passed under Article 149, the law to combat subversion. It's a law passed under Parliament's ordinary power to combat security threats. However, having said that, the law is incredibly broadly worded. Uh, the National Security Council headed by the Prime Minister, and it has the IGP and the Chief Secretary to the government and a few other ministers and a few other people. Uh, the NSC as Mr. Lau pointed out, actually has very broad powers because the word security itself is very broadly defined. By the way, uh, security, even in the constitution, doesn't refer only to war or to insurrection or to riots. Uh, even issues like economic threats are actually part of the concept of broader concept of security. So I agree with Mr. Lau that the National Security Council has very, very broad powers to issue instructions to all government entities. The word they use is government entities. So whether it's the police or the army or the statutory bodies or government departments, they can be issued instructions. And basically, it's a body headed by the prime minister, but with um, all the other important functionaries of the state. The National Security Council's Act has been challenged by many people uh, in, in constitutional discussion as being unconstitutional because it supposedly or it allegedly usurps the power of the young Dipartuanagong to declare emergency under Article 150. 
uh, in my personal view also the national security council act has many unconstitutional features but the problem is asan a law is valid and legal till declared illegal by the courts it is not for you and me to say no 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 because it usurps the powers therefore it is unconstitutional it may well be but it has not yet been declared unconstitutional so mr law i have to sadly report to you it is law till it is declared null and void and i agree with you it has very broad powers actually to integrate to coordinate virtually uh, the whole of the government however the only limitation i can think of is this and here is where my first point is important it's an ordinary law so for example there is one provision that they could ask people in particular areas to vacate their premises the nsc could ask me to vacate my premises and they could give me such reasonable compensation as they deem necessary now to me that's unconstitutional because under article 13 clause 2 of the constitution if my property is acquired or required i must get adequate compensation and adequacy must be determined by the courts not by the national security council so there are many features of the law that clearly seem to me to be unconstitutional but they have not yet been invalidated so the law is very broad indeed and everything that you say mr law i agree with uh, nsc uh, uh, may well be uh, running the state but i, I cannot say that uh, um, with any great confidence because we don't really have minutes of their meetings we don't really know what they decided except what uh, 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 we are receiving on our telephones and that's all that i have to say in reply Okay, thank you, uh, Prof. Shah. Um, I'm current. I'm looking at uh, some of the questions posed by the uh, attendees. Uh, first, perhaps as as I mentioned, there's quite a list number of questions. Yeah, uh, some, number some, of questions. Some, yes. Yeah, some of the questions are perhaps quite simple. Uh, that Prof. Uh, Shah maybe can provide some uh, straight uh, forward response, such as the first question by uh, Karam Veer Singh. why is the miti minister laying conditions for opening of businesses when it should be the health minister under the 1988 act um so it seems like how does it mix when two different uh, ministries are currently working while at the same time we are under the um national security council's administration so how does this work when it comes to different ministerial cabinet position with the yeah NSC? actually as an i did cover this point that minister should as far as possible coordinate uh, but it's entirely possible to give them benefit of that entirely possible that the health minister or health ministry has authorized miti to issue a directive on this issue but uh, he, 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 mr yeah. mr karam is entirely right under the law it's the health ministry that makes decisions on these matters Mm-hmm. Okay, I'm proceeding now to the question by Dr. Imran Ali uh, Sandono. Even though, though I think the Prof. Shah have already addressed uh, some of the main parts here, um, particularly during COVID-19, what situation government can make law? Uh, uh, so the question is: There any provision that is it first we practice some order and later make law, or make law first and proceed with order? I think you have you have some extra comment yeah, on that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, actually, that's a that's an interesting issue. Um, normally, uh, a law must be prospective in operation, forward in time, but it is permissible under our constitution, especially in tax matters or civil matters, um, to pass a law and backdate it. So, for example, the government may well spend money today and go to parliament. for is with the supplementary supply act and have the law backdated to legalize legitimize retrospectively mm. expenditure they have already incurred however two types of laws cannot be backdated number one a law that creates a new criminal offense mm-hmm. 
that cannot be backdated. So a, a law that says I cannot leave my house uh, uh, in, during these particular hours, during this particular time, uh, that law cannot be backdated. Secondly, if the law increases the penalty for an existing offense, if the penalty was, let us say, 500 ringgit, and now they say uh, five years jail, that's increasing the penalty. That is not permissible. So in answer uh, to, uh, to Dr. Imran, normally laws should be passed prospectively, but civil laws can be retrospective. Uh, two types of laws, however, criminal laws cannot be retrospective. So we'll have to look at which law you have in mind. Mm -hmm. Okay, Thanks. there's a question by Adriana, but this one is uh, rather related to something more on the future. I would assume perhaps after the threat of COVID uh, 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 later. But I, will, I think uh, we'll respond to Adriana's question maybe later. But before that, can we look into the question by Dharma Lingam Vinasi Timbati, uh, which the question is, there seems to be a contradiction between the six-month rule for parliament and emergency rule. Please clarif clarify, are there no limits on emergency rule? Um, Dharma, when the constitution was born in 57, uh, there were limits on emergency proclamations and they had to be laid before parliament within a particular time and parliament uh, um, had to ratify them, um, otherwise they would uh, cease to have effect. These limits were removed. So in answer to your question, an emergency proclamation once issued can last forever and ever. Um, by the way, emergency declared in 1964 and then in 66 and in 69 and in 77, the country was under emergency for 47 years. Uh, how can an emergency be lifted? There are two ways. One is this. The Yang Di Pratonagong, who issued the emergency proclamation, can withdraw that proclamation. So, executively, it is lifted. A second way is that Parliament may, by resolution, no need to pass a law, just by resolution in one house and in the other, annul the emergency proclamation. And may I point out to you that in November 2011, I think November 24th, 2011, the parliament annulled the three remaining emergency proclamations. So emergency was lifted in 2011. But uh, as I mentioned to you, um, uh, for all practical purposes, the country was under emergency from 64 to 2011. Emergency was the norm. Normalcy was the uh, abnormal thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yes. uh, Prof. Shad, still something uh, related to uh, the, the discussion on uh, NSC and the emergency. Question by Leong. Yeah? I'll read yes. through the question. All the action that the government has taken in handling COVID-19 can and has been taken even without invoking the NSC Act 2016, correct? So he would like uh, to get your clarification. If yes, why was the NSC Act 2016, uh, which concentrates such broad powers in the hands of the PM necessarily at all? And is the NSC Act 2016 constitutional at all? Yeah, well, the first part of the question that the NSC Act uh, has not been invoked. I, I don't think I can uh, agree with that. I think the NSC Act has been invoked repeatedly. For example, the army has been called out to assist the police. I presume that's under the NSC Act uh, in terms of coordinating all the government entities. Uh, uh, we are receiving messages from the uh, Security Council. I think that's all under the NSC Act. So I, I have to beg to uh, um, not to differ, but I have to say, I, I'm not really sure about that, Leon. Uh, I think the NSC Act has been very much uh, um, uh, invoked. The second part is, is it constitutional at all? I, I have expressed to you my views. I think some parts of it are clearly uh, unconstitutional. Uh, but as I said, uh, you and I are hampered uh, in that opinion because uh, 
um, your views and my views do not constitute uh, the law. It is the courts that have to decide. Someone has to knock on the doors of justice. The courts do not have a roving mission to go around declaring every law as constitutional or unconstitutional. Someone has to go to the courts and then the decision has to be made. Then there'll be appeal and further appeal. As far as I know, the NSC Act uh, is still a valid law. Thank you, Prof. Shai. I'll go to the question uh, which was uh, asked uh, by Adriana. Abu. Adriana, yes. Yeah, the first question uh, on the list. So, uh, if power is, de is derived from the law, how about persons or institutions which are or see themselves as above the law and conferred by birth and hereditary? How do we effectively proceed to disentangle these deep state powers after the MCO is uplifted? to ensure that every citizen, irrespective of birth, gender, status, lineage, is able to survive any lockdown or pandemic in the future. My sense relates to, yeah. Yeah, actually, Adriana, um, at the moment in our country, at the moment, since 1993, uh, everyone is subject to the constitution. In fact, everyone was subject to the constitution from day one. But uh, as you are aware, their majesties, the sultans and the young de Pratonagong enjoyed immunity, but that immunity was taken away in 1993. Malaysia is unique in that respect, that even the head of the state does not enjoy immunity in civil law and in criminal law. So in answer to your question, uh, in terms of crime, nobody and nobody is immune from the law. In terms of civil liability, Nobody is immune from the law. But having said that, the government under the Government Proceedings Act uh, or under the Public Authorities Protection Act enjoys a certain amount of immunity um, and uh, special privileges. But uh, uh, your question seems to be about individuals who have this feeling that because of their noble um, or hereditary uh, links, they are therefore above the law. Well, that's their feeling. Uh, we can't help their feelings if they feel that uh, they are superior, but in law, they are not. In law, actually, whether you are an ordinary person or you are uh, of noble heritage, uh, you're equal before the law. All persons are equal before the law and entitled to the equal protection of the law. That's what the Constitution says in Article 8, Clause 1. It says all persons. But of course, that doesn't prevent our constitution or any constitution from conferring some privileges or immunities. For example, judges have immunities while they perform their role as judges. But if a judge drives a car in a personal capacity, then I think he's, he's liable. Uh, MPs have parliamentary privilege on the floor of parliament. No, I should not say that. Uh, not on the floor. MPs have parliamentary privilege during parliamentary proceedings. Otherwise, they can be sued for defamation or for uh, uh, other things. But during parliamentary proceedings, they are immune from all laws except one law, and that is the sedition law. Sedition law applies in uh, parliament. Uh, members of the armed forces performing uh, functions as members of the armed forces enjoy certain amount of immunity. So immunities do exist, but these are basically functional. They don't relate to persons. They are functional. Judges, MPs, members of the armed forces. So God forbid, if an aeroplane were to crash, God forbid, then even if there was bad maintenance, the Air Force, the government cannot be sued in negligence because there is a certain amount of immunity given by the law to army personnel in the performance of their functions. So there is immunity in terms of functions, but persons, no person in his capacity as a person is immune anymore. Thank you, Prof. Shah. So um, I move to the next question. 
uh, which I think is quite interesting when it comes to uh, the question relates to some points regarding the related to the environment. Yeah. Uh, okay, the question uh, the, the person asking remains anonymous. I have a question on Prof Shah's last point about the environment versus the greed for wealth. Is it possible to elaborate more on the rules of the government on environmental protection under the constitution? Since environmental issues are sometimes quite vague and ambiguous, are there any ways to better protect the environment without the ambiguities being exploited? Um, uh, so the sense of the question is in relation to some protection uh, on the environment during this phase. Is there any uh, points that you may want to add up? Actually, it's a fantastic question. Most probably a university will take one whole semester to answer that <laughs> question. Uh, Environmental Qualities Act is there. Uh, we are supposed to have green lungs whenever um, developers want, want to develop an area. Whenever there is town and country planning, there is supposed to be consultation. My impression is this, uh, uh, that uh, the laws are in place but you see the sad thing is this justice is not in legislation justice is in administration there is also the problem of corruption there is also the problem of the deep state being able to influence executive decisions all of us have seen this with our own eyes that a housing estate will be built uh, there will be a nice area reserved for a children's park or a green lawn. Um, and uh, part of the reason we buy a house in that area is because there's a green lawn, there's a children's park, or there is some other such facility that we feel is uh, uh, conducive to uh, good living. Within a few years, the green lawn will be taken away. Uh, uh, the local authority will allow that area to be converted for development purposes. So actually, whether it's our rivers, whether it's the sea, whether it's the forest, uh, whether it's uh, density um, uh, in a particular area uh, in terms of population, whether it is factories emitting um, um, pollution, pollutants into the air. I used to work in Shah Alam for many, many decades. I used to travel from KL to Shah Alam and on both sides uh, there were factories. And uh, during the day, the, the, the smoke from the chimneys was not so visible. But when I come back in the evening, when I come back in the evening, 6.30 or so, I notice, whoa, the smoke from the chimneys is really full of color and uh, gushing out. So my guess was this, I may be wrong, my guess was this, that actually these factories were taking the necessary precautions during the day not to violate the law. But come sunset, wow, they were going uh, uh, full blown. They were they were ignoring the law. But there's a there's a lot of bad uh, enforcement of the law, and I have to say this to you with sadness. Everywhere in the world, um, our rivers are being converted into open sewerages, uh, mines, tin mines, and other mines actually are polluting the atmosphere. Forests are being um, logged. Um, so I, I think it's a problem around the world. And I try to mention this to you. Uh, basically, human beings think that everything on this earth exists for them. Actually, that's not so. In religion, in all religions, and certainly in Islam, everything on this earth given to us is a trust, is an amana from Allah. And actually, we are supposed to use it as a trust. But that's not the way we use it. So uh, I, I think the issue is very, very large. Um, I, I know these laws can be improved, but uh, uh, at the moment, the problem is corruption. The problem is bad administration. So um, in uh, Pahang, um, uh, things can be dumped. Uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, NGOs that made noise. We were hoping that actually um, these factories will be closed down, but no, because of the, the power, their power uh, over the government, uh, uh, they were given permission. Uh, by the way, I'm told that Malaysia was for a very long time, I hope it still is not, but for a very long time, Malaysia was a favorite 
dumping ground for um, uh, things that many nations did not want and they would nicely export to us. And then uh, businessmen would then dump them into the soil. Uh, some of that would seep into the rivers, into the sea. So yes, environment is a real problem. In my lifetime, I have seen rivers turn into open drains. I mean, the, the Klang River in the 60s used to have fish, used to have, now and then used to have crocodile. Now I'm not even sure if plankton grows inside the Klang River. It's a very large, large question that you ask and I do hope and pray that uh, your hopes in this area can be realized. Okay, thank you, Prof. Shai, um, for on, on your response on the topic related to the environment. So there are also those who want to give their questions uh, online via audio. Yeah, so I'll open. Professor Shad, uh, I'm Mr. Lau here. I'm a legal practitioner. Uh, and uh, actually, I agree with a lot of things that you have said, especially during this pandemic. You know, um, rule of law is extremely important. Uh, I observed that uh, there are many things, uh, many times the government has made policy announcements uh, even before uh, they have made the necessary uh, uh, laws and regulations, uh, subsidiary or primary, uh, before they make the policy announcement. I think one such example is this. A uh, few days ago, um, our, our defense ministry, Mayor Sabri, uh, mentioned that the 1,000 uh, fine, 1,000 ringgit fine, is not sufficient enough to deter people from coming out. So he suggested that you know, the, the government will want to increase the fine. However, later on, they realized that uh, they are not able to do so because Section 25 of the 1988 Act prescribes yes. the maximum fine to be 1,000. So yes, indeed. yesterday or a few days ago, suddenly the government says now, even though the offense has been made compoundable, we will not be issuing any compound and instead we will encourage the police to arrest those people who have been suspected of violating the MCO. Now, for me, uh, that is uh, that is an, an an obvious infringement of the rule of law because uh, sim sim it's, sim it's simply this: if the government feels that the fine is too low, the logical solution should be to increase the fine. And to do that, the government will have to call for an uh, urgent sitting of parliament to pass an amendment to the 1988 Act. And that is yes. why a lot of people have been calling the government to, um, to, uh, to, to call for an emergency sitting of parliament. So uh, I think the government has to seriously consider and not to make it a one-day sitting and uh, not be able to do anything just to fulfill the constitutional requirement of calling a parliament, calling the parliament for the sake of parliament. And, and that is, uh, for me, very bad. And another thing that I want to mention is this. I asked a question about the NSA. Um, uh, I wish to uh, note the observation that uh, until today, the Prime Minister has not declared any part of Malaysia to be a security area pursuant to uh, uh, Section 18 of the, of, of the NSC Act. And, and, and therefore, essentially, the NSC itself is not able to exercise those draconian power under the NSC Act to impose curfew, for example, to take away possession of uh, properties, to, to, to instruct for destruction of property. NSC is not able to do so. However, un however we have been seeing the NSC uh, uh, taking the lead uh, of uh, you know, fighting this pandemic as if uh, uh, they are the, they are the they are the government entity that is calling the shot. Um, so for me, uh, that is rather unconstitutional in, in that sense because uh, we, because you mentioned that you know directives are merely advisory, but the NSC yes. Act provides power to the NSC to issue directives to government entities. So how, how do we reconcile that? Because the NSC has the power to issue directives, they may issue directives which sounds like a law without going through parliament. So how, how, how do you reconcile that, you know, with the concept of uh, uh, separation of power? So perhaps we can hear some input from you on, on, in that regards. Yeah, thank, thank you, you Mr. Lau. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I agree with you that uh, 
parliament should sit and uh, not only uh, amend the 1980 attack to increase the fine if they wish, there are many other laws I pointed out which are needed uh, to solve many of the socioeconomic problems we are facing. Now this NSC, uh, you raised some very uh, fantastic issues. You point out that the security area was never declared. Uh, I'll have to check on that. Uh, and this would obviously require a lot of live research. My impression was that perhaps the entire country had been declared a security area in one go. But uh, this is something we have to check whether under Section 18 um, there was a security area declaration. So uh, I, I, I think your point is very, very important. I fully agree that before the act applies and the powers can be invoked, there must be a security area um, declaration. Now, the second issue on directives, uh, I have to clarify. I mean, Law, a directive can be a purely administrative one. Um, for example, a directive uh, may be issued to civil servants that uh, clock in, clock out, um, or uh, do physical exercise um, uh, for 15 minutes before you go back to your desk or prepare a particular uniform. Now, that directive, our instruction, or whatever you want to call it, is not law because it is not based on a statute. But if under a statute there is permission to issue a directive or an order or a scheme or an instruction by whatever name called, and then actually it is a piece of subsidiary legislation. As far as I know, under the subsidiary, under the delegated uh, legislation uh, ordinance, del sorry, Delegation of Powers uh, Act, um, subsidiary legislation can be called by many names, including a directive instruction scheme. But to me, the important thing is this. We must search for the fountain from which it emerges. If the fountain is a legislative fountain, there is a parent law, an akta ibu, and then it is legislative in nature. Then it's a form of legislation, subsidiary legislation. But if it's purely uh, an administrative order, then it is not law of the land. It is the law only for that office. You can take tata tarti, or discipline for your officers in your office. But you can't take people to the court. So when, when the bank, Bank Nagara says uh, loans should be um, frozen for six months. Employers are told to pay their salaries. While I fully support these measures, I want to know under which section, under which law have these directives or schemes or instructions been given. Because if there is no law backing them up, then they have no legal authority. They are merely advisory. So, uh, in answer to your question, you're right, there are under the NSC directives which are legislative in nature, but because they are derived from the law. But many of the directives being issued today are not derived from the law. I, I, I gave two or three examples. Uh, for example, employer must pay salary. Uh, uh, loan giving agencies must give a moratorium for a while. Under which law? That's my answer, sir. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Shad. Uh, as we are moving closer towards the end uh, of our discussion, I think I will just take the opportunity to ask uh, Prof. Shad uh, to elaborate a bit. Uh, yeah, mainly a question which comes from myself. Um, in relation to the situation of the movement control due to the COVID-19 situation and uh, the practices of religion, particularly among uh, the Muslim communities, as we are aware that Ramadan will be coming uh, soon uh, and next week. And I sense that the discourse, discussions online uh, tends to uh, discuss about, um, first of all, of course, the usual popular discussions about the Bazaar Ramadan that will surface from time. New suggestions and new ideas have surfaced. Uh, through calling for some kind of online apps that would improve the situation of the bazaar. Um, but at the same time, we know there will also be the usual um, 
uh, night prayer, the tarawih prayer that people will usually go to mosque. But my specific question is uh, if perhaps uh, Prof Shad could respond on um, generally understanding the regulation of uh, Islam within the Federation of Malaysia also involves uh, as part of a federal system in which generally Islam is being uh, administered and is under the uh, authority of state's authority rather than uh, a federal uh, institution. So at this situation, at this moment of movement control, um, who actually uh, possess or holds the authority to provide directives um, or provide uh, advices uh, of authority, uh, could, whether it is under the federal uh, authority, still under the National Security Council, or is it under state authorities, is it under the advices of muftis? Because I sense uh, this relations between Islam and federalism uh, is to be, is something could be of an important point during this phase. Uh, thank you so much, Hassan. Actually, it's a fantastic question. Uh, requires uh, a very thorough uh, and uh, uh, close uh, critical examination of the Constitution. I uh, will make some broad generalizations. Uh, quite clearly, Islam was meant to be in the hands of the state rulers. In fact, when the Constitution was being drafted, those who are aware of the history of the Constitution will know that actually uh, in 1956 and 57, uh, there were objections from their majesties at that time, of course. There were objections to putting Islam in the federal constitution by way of Article 3. Right now, Article 3, Clause 1, Islam is the religion of the federation, but all other religions may be practiced in peace and harmony. Some of the rulers were opposed to putting Islam in the federal constitution, not because they are opposed to Islam, because they felt that that would trespass on their authority over Islam at the state level. Nevertheless, uh, due to uh, negotiations between um, the ruling elite at that time and the rulers, the political, the ruling political elite and the rulers and the British and the Reed Commission, ultimately Article 3, Clause 1 was put in. However, the ruler's position as head, of the, as head of the religion of Islam in his state remains intact. Now, also, and this is something which is not generally understood, Hassan. Um, Islam is in state hands, but not across the board. Not everything connected with Islam is in state hands. May I give two or three examples? The holy pilgrimage, Hajj. Who controls the Hajj? Not the state authorities. Banking, Islamic banking, it's not a state matter. It is a federal law. Mm -hmm. It's a special law on that point, but it is a federal law. Criminal law, mm -hmm. murder, rape, theft, robbery, in whose hand it is? It's not in the hands of the state, it's in the hands of the federal government. The states have power over Islam on about 25 topics in the state list in the ninth schedule. It's a very long list, but basically, these are issues of Islamic personal or family law. In addition to marriage, divorce, maintenance, um, uh, wills, uh, inheritance, basically family law matters. There is, however, a very vague and expanding area. States have the power to create and punish offenses against the precepts of Islam, provided the offense is not already in the federal list or regulated by federal law. And when the state creates such an offense, the jurisdiction of the Sharia court 
shall be as determined by the federal law. So basically what I'm saying is this, not all of Islam is in state hands. Mm -hmm. Only 25 topics. These are mostly personal family law topics. And even in these areas, uh, the constitution says the state laws cannot violate the federal law mm -hmm. uh, on offenses. So for example, there is the Sharia Courts Criminal Jurisdiction Act 1965, which says states can punish Islamic criminal offenses against the precepts of Islam, but subject to the 365 rule. Mm -hmm. Three years jail, six strokes of whipping, and 5,000 ringgit fine. Mm -hmm. So that means murder, theft, rape, robbery, where which are covered by the penal code cannot be covered by the state. So in answer to your question, I uh, fully acknowledge when it comes to fasting, when it comes to prayers, administration of mosques, taraweh, uh, usra, I think these are all matters in, in, within the jurisdiction of their majesty, the sultan. But as I pointed out earlier, it is almost impossible in a federal system to have watertight compartmentalization. Mm -hmm. If going to Taraweh affects public health, mm -hmm. and of course, it is also a matter of Islamic precepts, then mm -hmm. we have an overlap mm -hmm. and the courts will now have to decide where it lies. And in my personal view, by far and large, this law, 1988 law and the movement control order is not really concerned with religion. It is in its pith and substance, in its core, it is dealing about health. Mm -hmm. So I think um, Islamic practices of Sambayang, um, um, Barjama'a, Taraweh, uh, Malam Jumaat, you have uh, Usra, all these practices are certainly part of Islam, no doubt about it, but nevertheless, I think they would be subject to the rules about public order, public health. Mm -hmm. There are in other countries issues like this. There are some religious sects, religious groups that don't want inoculation mm -hmm. because that is an a, a injection of a foreign body into your system. They don't want. But mm -hmm. on grounds of health, they have to. And if they don't, if they don't, um, it will be a criminal offense. In mm -hmm. some countries, including Malaysia, you have to send your kids to primary and secondary school. Now, if some parents say, no, no, I don't want my daughter to leave the home, I'll educate her entirely. Actually, that's an offense. <laughs> it's an offense. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I, I, have to, I have to mention this to you. While it is generally true that Islam is in state hands, for mostly family law matters. Mm. There is in every legal system, this problem where some things tend to overlap with other things. What a tight compartmentalization is not possible. And I think when it comes to uh, Taraweh, when it comes to uh, uh, Ramadan Bazaar, I think the courts will probably say in pith and substance, this is a health matter. Yeah. Um, and therefore, because it's a health matter, it's a federal matter. Federal law applies. The state must give way. Uh, also, just one final point. Under the Constitution, there is Article 75. If there is a federal law and there's a state law, the federal law prevails. Thank you very much, Prof. Shah. Thank you so excellent, much. Thank you. Uh, talk, excellent response to your questions. A very enlightening talk as well. Before uh, I, I have to say sorry to some of the attendees with some late questions. I think we are a bit out of time to respond. Though I think most of the questions is related much with uh, the NSC and some uh, related matters, which I think more or less have already been uh, addressed. Uh, by uh, Prof. Shad. Before we end, I would like to invite uh, Ali Salman again as our co-organizer, if there's any final inputs that you wanted to share. Ali? 
Asan, uh, thank you so much. No, no further input from my side, uh, Professor Shah. Thank you so much for thank you, sir. Very enlightening presentation and also conversation. Uh, highly educative, and uh, uh, I think I will just suggest uh, Asan as as organizer. We should uh, try to make an effort to uh, you know build more awareness uh, on the basis of today's talk and uh, maybe release some of these points as a uh, uh, media or media release, uh, so that those who have not attended um, the, the webinar can at least generally, uh, you know, get more knowledge about some of these issues, which are affecting definitely fundamental rights, uh, uh, affecting democracy, affecting uh, the public health issues. Uh, today's talk, I think, has been um, on the cross-cutting of all these important dimensions of our public and individual life. So I hope that we can make uh, justice uh, by promoting these uh, thoughts further beyond this webinar. And Professor Shah, again, thank you so much. Thank you so much. My great privilege and honor to be with you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ali Salman, for your uh, closing remarks. And thank you very much again to uh, uh, Prof. Shah. And again, I would like to invite all our participants to have your own Round of applause at home. <laughs> thank you so for your participation and thank you thank for you. your questions. And um, hopefully, we will continue with our webinar together, IRF and ILN, with uh, another topic in the coming weeks. Uh, I will, so um, just before ending, I would like to wish everyone to stay safe. Uh, yeah, of course, be part of the uh, stay at home uh, situation as well, so that hopefully things will get better. Uh, inshallah and for those uh, for Muslims mainly who will be celebrating Ramadan in the coming uh, yes. week I would like everyone to wish everyone for a happy Ramadan as well thank so you so much indeed next discussion. thank you very much uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Waalaikumsalam